Hello and welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for another one of our exciting tech startup events. Today I'm going to be joined by an exceptional Malaysian startup that's paving the way upwards for a new and ecologically sustainable way to grow fresh produce. Future Farms is an ag tech indoor vertical farming startup that emerged during the pandemic with the goal of solving the country's food security problems and delivering pesticide-free vegetables directly from the farm to the customers via their consumer-facing brand called The Vegetable Co. Future Farms is represented here today by its co-founder, Sean Ng. Sean is a master's graduate in green management, energy and corporate social responsibility from a university in Italy. And before setting up Future Farms, he worked as a business developer for a solar company catering to East African countries. Sean, we're so happy to have you with us today, and we're thrilled to hear more about you and your company. So firstly, Sean, over to you. We're going to hear um, an overview of your business. Right, lovely. So yeah, thank you for having me. And yeah, as uh, Julia mentioned, we're Future Farms. We're an indoor farming company based here in Malaysia, and we're about two, two and a half to three years old right now. So what we're looking to do is, first and foremost, we're looking to feed the world. Basically, urbanization is happening on a rapid rate, and we're looking at 68% of the population being in urban centers by 2050. And food yield generally is dropping on a year-on-year -year basis. So we were looking for a way to grow food in a scalable and sustainable manner to be able to address this urban demands in essence. So what is the opportunity here in Malaysia? We start in Malaysia because first and foremost, food import is pretty high in Malaysia. We import about 55 and a half billion ringgit of food, which is about 11 plus uh, billion USD. And at the same time, our rice self-sufficiency level is uh, pretty low at around 63%. Uh, using 2019 data. So there is a demand for locally grown food within the country itself. Looking at the global outlook, you can see there are similar challenges or opportunities when it comes to food import. So we use data right here for uh, lettuces and bok choy, which is what we can and do grow. And uh, when you look at the numbers, uh, there is opportunity in countries such as the uh, United States and Germany. And of course, Hong Kong is uh, one of the ones that are pretty high up there as well. In addition to that, we also have the 30 by 30 in Singapore, our neighbor, and they're looking to grow 30% of their food by 2030, and they're investing quite heavily in the area, and we believe there's an opportunity there as well. So what is controlled environment farming? So controlled environment farming is basically us looking to grow food in a complete controlled setting. So we control every single parameters pertaining to plant growth, which is things like light, water, nutrient, humidity, and um, CO2 levels. And this ensures that we're able to grow food in the most optimal manner. Um, additionally, we grow in a closed environment, so no pest and in essence, no pesticide. And given that we grow using um, an automated system and using machineries, we tend to reduce the amount of labor as well. This is more photos of how our farms generally look. So you're looking at vertical stacks, you're looking at LED lights, and of course you're looking at the highest level of security and hygiene through the utilization of PPEs and gloves and legs. Uh, what is the benefit? So in terms of sustainability, indoor farming has the benefit of growing food right where the demand is. So we reduce the whole carbon chain of logistics in essence, and we grow food exactly where it needs to be. In addition to that, we don't use pesticides and we also reduce uh, water pollution. In terms of comparison to traditional farming, we are also about 90% more water efficient and 95% more land efficient, while also having about 95-96% less waste due to the fact that most of our vegetables are pristine and in the best conditions. So yeah, very quickly about the company, um, we came about in May 2019, it's almost three years now, and since then we have built two farms and uh, we're growing rapidly as well. These are our farms, so we started off with a container farm in 2019, and we moved on to a indoor facility that produces up to one and a half tons of vegetables. And now what we're looking to do is we're looking to expand to another bigger facility, which is about five tons in uh, monthly volume. 
We also have an exhibition early this year. So we are able to build really big farms, really small farms and really, really small farms. And uh, we had this out to basically tell the market what we do. And this is a fully functioning indoor farm. And uh, the market was very receptive uh, when we presented it in January this year. Here is more photos of the event itself. And we've gotten very good receptions and we won an award on the day itself as well. So yeah, what makes indoor farming special and what makes our indoor farming special? So we have customizable vertical stacks. So as mentioned, we can build really big farms and really small farms. So as long as there's a space, we can retrofit it. And that gives us a, a lot of flexibility. Additionally, we design all of our tech in, in-house. So we really know what is each and every component that goes into building an indoor farm. And that gives us the ability to troubleshoot and improve wherever we need to. Uh, we also have a farming software uh, that we developed to help us optimize uh, our farm yield and also to monitor the day-to-day -day of our farming operations. Um, and as Julia mentioned, we do have a vegetable cold brand, which is a consumer-facing brand that we use to get the freshest, most delicious pesticide-free vegetables directly to consumers. And we're looking to penetrate supermarkets soon as well. And so yeah, what does Future Farms actually do? So we're in an end-to-end farm building solution. So if you require us to build a farm, we can design and build it. We can operate and maintain the farm. And of course, we can market the end products as well, if and when necessary. The next few slides will be some of the farms that uh, we built and we can build. And the first one's the Hanazaku series. Uh, this is something more aesthetic in nature, and it helps to tell the market what it is. And it's basically a spectacle. We also do container farms, and these farms are modular in nature, so we can place them anywhere and they can be deployed relatively quickly. So you are looking at the ability to grow food in any ecosystem, utilizing only about 300, 400 square feet of space, and you can start growing food almost immediately. And finally, we have the most modular of all systems. We have an indoor farm. So in this slide, it's only about 1,000 square feet, but of course, we can do anything from 500 to 5,000 to 10,000. And we're able to basically create a fully functional, highly efficient food production facility for um, any kind of consumer or commercial needs. These are some of the vegetables that we offer. Uh, we do mostly Western vegetables for the moment. So things like kales, lettuces, and arugula. But we're also looking to do some development on Asian vegetables, herbs, flowers, etc as we grow and expand our business. So I'm going to wrap this conversation up with why we're a bit different. Uh, so our advantage is that we're able to grow more efficiently in essence. So we grow more in less space and use less energy. And this was using 2021 data that was from a recent census. So we believe that we are more cost competitive when it comes to our competition at the moment. Um, and that is all from me for today. Thank you so much for giving me the time to speak, actually. Hopefully this presentation is good enough to share with you a little bit on who we are and what we do. And uh, let's get the conversation going. Thanks, Sean. Wow, I find that completely fascinating. I love everything you're doing in your company and the focus. And those modules that really look like mini recording studios. So you actually source those and you can supply them to people. Is that how that works? Or yeah, absolutely. So if anyone wants to build a farm uh, for any purpose, um, regardless of what they need to do it, we're able to fulfill their needs and basically build a farm for them. Right. And have you done that for people in Malaysia? Not exactly. We've only just started this for the moment. So we, over the last two years, what we looked to do was educate the market on what mm -hmm. we do. And that's why we had the consumer facing brand to start with. But this year onwards, we are speaking to quite a number of interested parties and uh, the conversation is moving along relatively rapidly. Right. And are those kind of indoor booths or could you have them outdoor as an alternative? We prefer to have them indoors if possible. Right, right, right. And do they run off yeah. electricity or is there any solar aspect to them? They do run on electricity. We are, for example, we are a completely renewable company in the sense that we utilize green electricity tariffs. So uh, there is that aspect of things. But additionally, we can also implement a solar infrastructure or a hydro infrastructure to connect itself to the farm itself. And that would also work. Are those booths manufactured in Man Malaysia or are they manufactured somewhere else that you're using for those prototypes? 
Uh, so the components are manufactured across the world. Mm -hmm. But of course, we bring them to Malaysia and we assemble them. Uh, right, right, right. And so could you, for example, supply one theoretically in the future? Could you supply one of those to Hong Kong? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we, we could have uh, mini farms in all of our offices in Hong Kong, couldn't we? Uh, that would just be so cool, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, wouldn't that be great for everybody? Because it would be so green and uh, such such a nice thing to have in an office. Yeah. Everyone's been working from home, but when they come back to work and they can have a farm in the office, that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. So what made you and your colleagues decide that this is what you needed to do? You know, how did this idea come to you? Well, I think it was primarily about food security. So, you know, like food yield was always an issue and we were looking for a way to grow food in a very systematic and sensible manner. And uh, that's why we started venturing into figuring out what's the best way to grow food in given the worst case scenario, you know, like given the possibility that uh, the sun doesn't exist anymore or, you know, like global warming causing massive droughts or massive floods. So we wanted to figure out a way to create an environment where we're able to grow food with like 100% consistency. And we leaned on controlled environment farming, of course. It was a technology that was young, but it was maturing. And we believed there was a lot of opportunity within that realm and we did a lot of research and R&D, and we just decided to go with that. Was there anything about the COVID pandemic that sort of sparked you to think about this, do you think? The pandemic definitely brought an additional element into the conversation. But uh, the thing is, we started the company right before the pandemic. I mean, COVID was not a thing when we started the company. We knew that food yield was becoming increasingly erratic. That was already an issue prior to the pandemic. But with the pandemic and the consequences of it, like the lockdown and logistics issues, uh, it definitely reinforced our belief that. Goodness, I know. Talk about the right time to start thinking about this. Because when you think about places that are locked down for COVID and people are worrying about food and fresh food and so on, I mean, this is sort of the perfect time to be really doing this and putting it in place. Well, it's almost a bit late. Some people should have had it already, shouldn't they? And, and then we've also got all these geopolitical issues about food security and shortages of wheat supply because some of the main growing areas in the world are being affected. I mean, this this is just so timely that you're doing this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I guess there's two things I could share here. Well, first, during the initial lockdown, there was food stuck in one part of Malaysia that couldn't go to another part of Malaysia due to like restrictions and movement restrictions in essence. So that was always a demand that we could look to fill. And as you mentioned, like food security on a nation by nation basis, that is another conversation that is very big and very important. Yeah, yeah. And there's just so much possibility with this, isn't there? I remember actually back into the 19th century, but part of the 20th century, there was a lot of sort of cooperative farming movements and actually throughout the um, the, U the UK, but particularly, I think, after World War II, there was quite a lot of farming initiatives of cooperative farms and so on, it's very small ones. And you could imagine this being the ideal cooperative venture, couldn't you? Like a building, people get together to do this, or neighbours get together to do this. I mean, it's just got so much community element to it, I think, hasn't it? I can see so many possibilities for it in an urban environment, yeah. It, it's it's good on so many levels. It's good for food security, but it must be good for the community. And it's probably good for people's mental health to be growing things as well. I think the only thing I can really see as a possible challenge is the amount of energy it uses. Have you got any more thoughts about that? Definitely. So indoor farming saves on a lot of things. We reduce water utilization. We reduce the need to log and to basically use more land. But energy is always uh, a very big conversation within the realm of indoor farming. And that's why the mandate for our company itself is we're looking to reduce the cost of energy as much as possible. We're looking for efficiency. That's always the main thing for us, especially within the R&D team. They're looking to bring down the cost to increase the efficiency. But at the same time, alternative energy sources would also play a big part into this conversation. No? Because if you start considering nuclear fusion, you know, once you have an infinite source of energy, the conversation shifts tremendously. But until then, we are looking at increasing energy efficiency wherever we can.
Yeah, yeah. And I suppose the expensiveness of the energy is probably a bit less of an issue if you're looking at much more expensive crops. You know, I noticed on your list of prospective crops, you've got some higher, some traditionally more expensive things like the herbs, for example, tend to be a bit more expensive. Or something like vanilla or saffron would be very expensive, wouldn't it? If you could crack that, that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. There are players in the industry playing around with saffron and strawberries and things like that. It's a very high potential area for development. Yes, yeah. So what's the potential? Tell me more about the potential for a lot of this being organic. You know, how does that work? Organic is a tricky little conversation because for most uh, of the world, the organic conversation revolves around the soil. Given that it's a hydroponic system, it's a bit tricky, so, but we do see it being implemented gradually. So like Singapore has an organic standard for hydroponic crops. Right. So you need a kind of neo-organic standard for this type of crop. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You kind of need to have a different way of looking at the same thing. But we do believe that slowly, slowly people are looking to adapt uh, this concept of, you know, vertical farming into organic standards and stuff. Right, right, right. And I know in your own background that you worked in a solar company um, for clients in East Africa. Did some of your work there inspire you to do what you're doing now? Um, very different industries. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess the fundamental idea remains the same. Like we're looking for disruption. We're looking for ways to create the maximum amount of impact, utilizing a different way of doing things. So rather than going through the traditional route, traditional infrastructure. So if you're looking at solar in Africa, for example, you know, uh, what we looked to do was decentralization. We were trying to put energy where there isn't a electricity grid, where there is an infrastructure rather than building yeah. the infrastructure outwards. Similar principles apply here, you know, instead of creating the supply chain infrastructure to get food from very far away, to urban centers, we just try to put food exactly where the demand is. Yes, yeah. And of course, with so much of the world urbanizing, this is going to be more and more important, isn't it? As more and more of the population growth is in urban areas, um, you get rid of some of this urban rural divide, perhaps to some extent, which has always been a sort of, it's held some countries back, I think, that divide between the income levels in the urban and the rural areas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there is opportunity there. Yeah. So this, this starting this startup, was it always part of your plan that you were going to do something like this? Or was it an opportunity that just was too good to miss? It was an opportunity, really. Most of this came about due to my co-founder. Oh, you're very <laughs> modest, John. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's true. It's his idea. He He's the one that brought the idea to me. And, and uh, I, I saw some potential in it. He saw some potential in it. Uh, and we just kick started and just ran with it. Right, right, right. So how many employees do you have at the moment? And how do you manage the cultivation and the delivery of the produce? Is that outsourced or how are you doing all that? Growing cultivation, it's all in-house. So uh, the company is small. We're still about 10 to 15 people. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, given the way we farm, uh, labor is at a minimum. We don't really need too many people to grow food because most of the work is done automatically, yeah. like the dosing of the nutrients or the, the light and the watering of plants, all of these things is an automatic system. So half of or three quarters of the work is really taken care of. You only need farmers for just the more direct manual work, which is things like harvesting and packaging and so on and so forth. Right. So, so that part of the supply chain, I guess we do it. But with regards to delivery, we utilize third parties to leverage on the ecosystem that's available. Right, right, right. Yeah, I was actually born on a farm and I spent a lot of my time growing up on a farm. And I remember what hard work farming is, you know, having to get up at four or five in the morning and go out and with tractors and things. So you don't have to do that with this, right? It's much more regular hours, is it? Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to wake up at the rise of dawn. So do you need to program all of this and really calibrate it so it almost becomes more of a tech job or and, and to get it right as to how much nutrients, how much sunlight are the optimum amounts, who works on all of that and how do you do it? Everything is optimized. Everything is technologically driven. So that's why we're an ag tech company. We're not mm -hmm. just an agriculture company. 
but it's a lot of research and it's a lot of optimization. Like even right now, we are doing really well, but of course we could make it even better. So it's about uh, collecting the data on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, putting it through a system and looking to optimize it wherever we can, however we can. Right, right. And who does that? A bunch of tech guys who's doing all of that research? Um, it's our engineering team and yeah, it's basically the science department of the company. Right. So R&D is everything to you, right? That's what's driving R it. Yeah. R&D is our lifeblood. <laughs> got it. Got it. Yeah. Mm. So you're in charge of the commercial and market education side of things. So what does that involve? I mean, obviously you're here today telling us all about it, but what do you do most days? Um, what, well, mostly I educate, I guess, in a way, the Malaysian public, which I hope some of them may be here today. But I think it's a lot about communicating. You know, It's a lot about telling people that we are doing something that may seem like it's very similar to what you're used to, but it's a little bit different. And sharing the true benefits of why doing it differently matters, which of course thinks about sustainability, about better food quality, better food safety, and things like that. That's my day-to-day, -day, basically. But you say it's what people are doing already. Really? Most people in cities aren't doing this. They haven't even thought about it, have they? What I meant by that is about vegetables, no? It's a commodity, basically. It's a very ubiquitous product if you look at vegetables as a concept. Yeah, because they just arrive on the shelves, right, to a lot of people. They don't think about them being grown from the get-go. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it's, it's educating people to think a little bit further beyond the supermarket shelves or beyond the plate and to think about what transpired from the point of growth all the way up to your plate. Part of the inspiration for me was the masters, no? Because I did a masters in quote unquote sustainability. It made me really reflect on the importance of traceability, the importance of understanding the supply chain of your food, not just food, of everything, your clothes, your whatever. The points beyond the point of consumption matters and, and it matters on a global scale. So you really have to understand what you're consuming for whatever reason, it could be ethical, it could be for health reason, it could be for whatever reason, but it's important. And do you eat all the products yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You're looking pretty healthy. <laughs> Which is your favorite one that you grow? Honestly, the lettuce is amazing. It's, it's super crispy, it's crunchy, and it's sweet. Everyone loves it. That's great. That's great. And what's the price point of the vegetables that you're selling? Because they're kind of sort of organic and they're being delivered and they're very special. So what's the sort of price point of the vegetables you sell? If you mitigate the delivery cost, the product is, of course, yes, it's at a premium compared to the quote unquote traditional vegetables, you know, like yeah. the things you find in the wet markets. But in terms of comparison to other lettuces and um, other basil and so on and so forth, it's pretty much price comparative. And we are quite proud of that actually. And of course, we will keep looking to bring the cost down whenever possible. So what's the susceptibility to disease of vegetables which are growing in this environment? Because it's quite, I suppose, a clear and sterile environment for them, isn't it? Mm, it is definitely something we have to take into account. And at the same time, that's why we try to ensure like we have multiple protocols when it comes to ensuring that the farm is as clean as possible to make sure that the plants are safe and healthy. Do you think over time these particular plants that grow in this way will potentially be less hardy? Will they become species that can't grow outside that have to grow in this type of environment? There is always a possibility of that, uh, but it's about the seeds. No? The seeds are meant for certain environments and it's how you cultivate those seeds from the get-go that creates the, uh, the effects, per se. Right, right, right. And where do you get your seeds from? We get them from suppliers across the world. I mean, we get them from big suppliers, really. And right. these suppliers are uh, confident in their ways of growing food. So they have seeds for outdoor farming and also for indoor farming. Mm -hmm. okay. So are any of those produced in Malaysia or are you you're having to rely on importing those? Uh, no, no, it's, we have both. We, we have seed suppliers from Malaysia. Yeah. So can you explain how the decentralized remote farm network operates? Because you've talked about that. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Because your farms are everywhere, but you have a centralized module to modulate yes. and control all of them. 
and basically it works through magic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it, it operates on the cloud, so everything's connected through a cloud system, cloud-based system, and we have a central server to kind of modulate everything. And of course, like most of the process is automated anyway. So it, there are certain set of rules and laws that uh, governs how each farm should behave. And we just create a system that uh, kind of monitors and manage that. Right. I mean, when you say through magic, it's not far off because it is very futuristic in a way, isn't it? What you're talking about. Mm. Yeah, yeah, 100%. But then again, speaking to you in Hong Kong, it's also pretty... I suppose, yeah, yeah, yeah. 30 years ago, we wouldn't have been doing this like this, would we? Yeah. <laughs> so how does the taste and the quality compare, do you think? I mean, you've said you think that it's great, but is that generally the consensus about that? I think the biggest thing that people get back to me with the strongest feedback is freshness. So our vegetables, we tell people that you can keep for up to two weeks, but we have people coming back to us saying it's lasted for three weeks, for four weeks. And that's always an impressive statement. Uh, in terms of quality and taste, yes, 100%. It definitely has a sense of crunch, the lettuces. Uh, our basil is more fragrant, our arugula is more spicy. So there is definitely some kind of like textile um, fragrant kind of like a comparison as well. There's an intensity. Is that because of the farming methods, do you think, or the seeds, or it's just some unknown quotient of what you're doing? It is definitely monitored. So we grow them specifically to be spicier and punchier. So it's about playing with the environment because once again, uh, it all goes back to plant science. It all relates to photosynthesis and plant physiology when it comes to photosynthesis. So by giving it a little bit more of this, a little bit less of that and uh, spectrum as well. So our lights are customized based on spectrum. So instead of a generic flow of how much red green or blue light or whatnot there is a custom amount of certain wavelengths and that also gives us an advantage when it comes to modularity in terms of plants so how is that monitored does it need to be monitored real time or somehow there's sensors that do that oh it's all sensors it's sensors. Sensors. Okay. Yeah. so you've mentioned that your products use about 90 percent less water on average so how does that work how do plants do well on relatively less water they actually have the exact same amount of water they need that's the advantage of a hydroponic system isn't it yeah right 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 okay that makes sense yeah so if you were looking at the conditions or factors when selecting an area to set up a vertical farm, what would you be considering and looking at? Um, I think it's just three main things, uh, flatland, power source and water source. I think as long as you hit those three criteria, we're good to go anywhere in the world. Right. Okay. Nothing else? Everything else can be worked around. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if you really want to go more into it, of course, it's about the business case. It's about the power cost, you know, how much it does yeah, utility yeah, yeah. costs and labor. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've mentioned that you grow other crops as requested by customers. How does that work? Do you have to figure out whether you can or you can't when people are asking you about new crops? Because there must be particular yeah. challenges for some of them, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. For example, we can't grow trees, we can't grow potatoes. We can, but it's just very inefficient to do so. Yeah. Definitely know that. So certain crops is best grown outdoors. But for those that we can grow, then it's about understanding the physiology of the plants once again. So it's about understanding what makes sp specific plants grow. No? What makes a nasturtium, which is a sort of flower, what makes it grow, what makes a micro cilantro, uh, what makes that grow and understanding the physiology behind it and then we can look to grow it for yeah. whoever. It seems that a lot of the plants you're doing well with have a lot of photosynthesis, right? I mean, you know, there's none for, correct me if I'm wrong, but well, um, yeah, there is for the upper part of a potato plant, but not for the tubers under the ground, right? So, you know, lettuces are all green, aren't they? And that's a lot of photosynthesis. Yeah, I think generally plants with bigger leaves do tend to grow better, but it's also, so what really, what does really, really well in indoor farms are low calorific crops. So the shorter the harvest cycle, the, the in a way lighter it is, uh, those are easier crops to grow. Right, like bean sprouts would be easy, right? Bean sprouts would be easy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Right, okay. So you've mentioned that you use less energy than your competitors. Um, and you've explained to me quite a lot about energy, about you know the difficulties and so on. But how do you save energy? To be honest, I think I am not the best person to answer this, but I'll try my best because this is pretty much better than me. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But I'll try, I'll try. So in essence, what we look to do is we just generally look to be more efficient. So first and foremost, I think as long as we get the conditions right, that helps a lot. We just did a lot of research into exactly what the plants need. And we just tailor everything in according to that. And that helps us be more efficient in many ways. And of course, there's a lot of engineering components behind it as to reducing the power utilization of different equipments. But once again, that's way beyond my scope. Right. So you could, in theory, have an outside container which would have solar panels on the roof or something like that, could you? Or or, to generate electricity? Would you ever do something like that to produce the light? Or would you prefer a more permanent source of electricity? No, they both work. Every single additional energy source is a good supplement. I think that's a good way of looking at it. Of course, it's never going to be enough. Solar panels don't work at night, but of course, it definitely helps with supplementation and we do need more green energy in the world. And I remember hearing that for the development of light spectrums that best fit your plant growth, you had to conduct very intensive trials on over 100,000 plants. So how long did that take and how did you do that and who did it? I think this ties back to the initial question of why we're more efficient. So it did take about 10,000 plants, 100,000 plants for us to get there. It took about two years actually for us to get to where we are now and we're still not satisfied. So we'll keep going, but definitely. So what we test is, you know, it's, it's about the spectrums. It's about the conditions and all the single data points that we have from understanding how much light to give, how much water to give, what's the temperature that it grows best at. And those are little things that we test over a two-year period intensively. And uh, with regards to who does it, it's, once again, my co-founder and his uh, tech team are the ones that go through it on a daily basis. And they are basically cracking the formula of growing, for now, lettuces and kale in the most effective manner. So in your industry, do you have kind of industry conferences where people share any of this know-how, or is it all just super competitive and you're all competing with each other? It's pretty quiet-ish. I mean, of course, there is an indoor ag tech conference in New York last year. There are seminars and conferences all around. And there's this uh, organization called Agritecture, which uh, supports the industry very, uh, very starkly. And they come up with reports and surveys. And uh, those are primarily the comparative information that you normally get when it comes to indoor farming knowledge. Are there any aspects of your process that you could patent? You know, if you, I'm not saying maybe now, but say you develop something in such a special way, would there be things that would be patentable or you, know, or is it just more sort of know-how that you're developing? I think that you definitely can, there are many, many things within uh, the industry that can be patented from the equipment to the arrangement of uh, your hardwares. I'm not sure if light spectrums can be patented, because that feels like, I don't know, I mean... It, There'd be sequencing be... of light pat- patterns, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. So so there is potential. Yeah. yeah. Having said that, I'm not an intellectual property lawyer, so I'm not sure that was right. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw in your presentation that you said it was four hours work a day to have a farm, right? So if somebody, like a family, decided they were going to have a farm, would that be, mm. they'd have to dedicate four hours a day to it, would they? If it's a home farm, it's even less. Four hours is for a commercially viable farm. You know, things like planting, harvesting, cleaning up, and those kind of like little, little labor that just has to be done. So for a home farm, how much do you think? Say I got one of those booths and I decided I was going to have that for home. How much, how time consuming is that? It's just a little bit of planning. So it's understanding, do you want to dedicate harvesting to a daily task or do you want to do it once a week? That kind of creates the structure of the workload. So if you harvest once a week, then of course you have to plant once a week. And if you do it every day, then it's less time, but it's more frequency. So those are the things you're playing around with. So if you decided to do it at home like that, do you think it would be a net cost to you, but good for the environment and good for your health and everything else, obviously? Or would it kind of break even in some way because of the food? Or how how would you look at that? 
Home units are not very efficient at the moment, mm. so it's probably not going to break even. It probably costs you a little bit more. It's more of a hobby and labor. Like and gardening, you don't make money out of your garden, right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you probably get too much of one crop, uh, yes. or none at all, or not enough. Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, but... being force-fed gooseberries when I was growing up because we had a lot of them. <laughs> but it runs in the similar vein, uh, but of course with this kind of farming method you get a bit more options you know you can grow a smaller variety of crops and that that helps right 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 so what would be the cost of a home unit at the moment you know roughly just very ballpark we are currently developing a real home unit i guess in a way something much smaller something the size of a mini fridge mm -hmm. But we we don't know what the cost of it is yet, so we'll get back. Okay, to that. so when you have this, Sean, let's have another webinar like this, and we can have a whole session on how to grow this because it's going to be yeah, so yeah, cool yeah, and so popular. Sorry. Yeah, that's going to be amazing. Yeah, and anybody can do this without sort of training skill sets. You, I suppose, you need training, right? You've got to understand what you're doing to get this right. You're right. Not exactly. I mean, that's the beauty of it. No, almost everything is done for you. You only maybe need like the most minuscule amount of training in terms of how to put a seed in a substrate and uh, how to harvest a vegetable and how to fill up a tank. Maybe that's about most of the work. Everything else can either be shared with you through a manual or just done automatically through our system. And that's kind of the beauty of the whole thing because every single new farmer that we may look to train, uh, they don't really have to go through much of a training process. They just have to follow the instructions on the manual and the system runs itself. Interesting. So now some questions that are really dear to my own heart, because I'm a corporate finance lawyer. So what stage are you at in your fundraising, Sean? And where do you see the business going? We are post seed. So we're looking to raise either a bridge or a <laughs> Literally and figuratively, right? Post seed. <laughs> wow, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So we are proceed. We're looking to fundraise at the end of the year with either a Series A round or a bridge round, something along those lines. So we're relatively young in terms of our financing stages. But of course, I, I see a lot of potential with the company because first and foremost, within the development of tech, I think we as a company, I think we are competitive with global competition, but we want to look to be better. So that's an avenue of um, opportunity there as it is. But within the market itself, as mentioned, as I shared with you on our slides, there is opportunity in the market. You can definitely put a farm like this anywhere in the world and it has potential to grow and to expand. And we look to capture those markets as well. So are you looking for funding within Malaysia or are you going to look outside of Malaysia? We are location agnostic when it comes to funding, but we are also looking at strategic value when investors come in. So what's your ultimate game plan? I mean, would you list on a stock exchange? You know, where would you see the whole business in five years time? So the business function itself, I think we see it as something that uh, has global potential. So something that's able to saturate and be implemented anywhere. And that's what we're looking to do. You know? We're looking to put a farm in every urban cities, if possible. That's the really, really, really long term game plan. And we look to have our systems in uh, global community. So we look to have our systems implemented by people across the world for whatever purpose, whether they only want a farm or they want a system or they want our vegetables. In terms of listing or acquisition, uh, we're flexible, but we're definitely looking to reach that sort of trajectory. Listing on uh, exchanges are definitely interesting to us. Uh, it's something we're striving to uh, work to us too. But an acquisition by a major player in the global industry, that's definitely within the conversation as well. Right, right. So how, for a start, how many vertical farms are you intending to see set up in Malaysia? What's your plan on that? We're looking at probably another, at least another four to six more, I think, in the country. I think that would somewhat suffice. Once again, Malaysia is not really a big country. We have about maybe 36 million people. It's not small. <laughs> no, it's not small either, but it's not dense. It's not as dense as, let's say, Hong Kong. So Yeah, absolutely. Or, yeah. or Tokyo. Yeah. yeah. So I think about, yeah, maybe six-ish farms, maybe 10 farms should be enough for the country, but we're looking to expand regionally way before that as well. Right. So, so where would be the places regionally which you would focus on for expansion? 
big cities in Southeast Asia is always an interesting potential. So, you know, Jakarta, Bangkok, Hong Kong is very, very interesting, but needs a lot of market research, I think, to truly understand market demand and also the political and regulatory landscape when it comes to indoor farming. China, Japan, very cool. They, in a way, they are pioneers, but we believe there's opportunity as well. And of course, countries like the Middle East and anywhere. Yeah, I mean, I mean places where there's water shortages and things would seem optimum for this, wouldn't they? Yeah. What about Africa? Have you thought about how would this work in Africa? It really depends. I think it solves some problems when it comes to specific crops that they don't have. I think that definitely is an area for consideration. And Africa is a growing continent. You know, it's growing extremely rapidly. Some of the um, urban centers are huge, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they're massive. Nairobi's big. Cape Town's huge. There are opportunities over there as well. But how would you grow there? I mean, would you franchise? Would you do a joint venture? Would you just get someone else to do it and then you provide the software? How would you see that happening? Or are you flexible about that? We are pretty flexible about that for the moment, but we'll see. Uh, we're flexible to do anything, but it's about understanding the market before penetrating. Yes, yes. So I'm just looking at some of the questions that have come in, and actually one of them relates to Hong Kong, but it's quite specialized, but I'll ask you anyway. This is from Andrew Wells. There's some vertical farming in Hong Kong now. Have you looked at what startups here and also some universities are doing? A problem is that w this is Hong Kong. We are so intensely developed, even by urban standards. Are rooftops the solution? On Saffron, he says he's been to production facilities in Iran. The tech is quite difficult. Would that even be feasible? I think there's a whole lot of questions here. So basically, you know, have you looked at Hong Kong? Um, it's so dense. Does that present particular problems? I think those are probably his main questions. Yeah. Okay, so we've not deep dived into Hong Kong, but we do know one vertical farming company over there called Common Farms, I think. And they've been around over there for a while. I spoke to one of the founders, might have been, yeah, Jessica Fong, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's her vertical farm. So she did highlight a couple of challenges of entering Hong Kong and what the climate is like. It's not the easiest climate to enter, given, as you may know, land is not cheap. Uh, space is very, very scarce over there. So there is definitely challenges in entering. But at the same time, if there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, there's also quite a lot of agricultural land in Hong Kong, which, you know, Hong Kong land prices depend on what you can use the land for. And there's some mm. land which is restricted to agricultural which is, is much, much cheaper than other land. So it, it's, it's yeah. a sort of tiered system of land pricing in a way, depending on the usage of the land. Yeah. yeah, so maybe that's what we can look into. Yeah. So here's some more questions from people watching. May I know how much it would cost to build a 1,000 square foot indoor farming system and how long would it take? That's a question okay, someone's so... asked. <laughs> It depends on the country, but let's just use the Malaysian context. So about 1,000 square feet would be close to a million ringgit, maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more, but roughly around that ballpark. And how much uh, is that in USD, a million ringgit? Uh, about 250 grand, I think. Yeah. And with regards to setup time or deployment time, generally our promise is that we can do it within three months. So uh, first harvest within a three to four month window. Right, yeah. so about 350,000 US and three to four months. Okay, here's another question, which I think you did talk about a bit. Um, will your firm consider growing crops like rice and wheat? Could really help with the food security issues you guys are talking about, plus those are the more calorie dense staples that will be needed more. I guess that raises multiple issues, right? Definitely keen to explore. We're actually looking to do some R&D on the matter right now already. So we're definitely looking to grow rice. We believe there is potential there. Uh, there's even certain rice genetics or like, you know, rice variants that are a bit shorter. So those would help as well. And it would solve a lot of problems once we crack the rice equation. Yeah, that would, wouldn't it? So someone else has asked, what award did you win? And is the app um, you mentioned available for open use or just for your company? So the event itself was run by an organization called Thought for Food, and they're basically an international food system kind of organization that promotes uh, agri-tech and things like that. And we got a Changemaker Award for being novel and innovative when it comes to 
growing food. Uh, the second part of the question, software. Uh, we are open to discussions. For the moment, it's specifically for indoor farming and our indoor farms, but it's definitely part of the conversation to, to lease it out. Right, right, okay. Um, some more questions from the audience. What about crop pollination? Is that not needed for your process? Pollination normally relates to flowers. So for the moment, not really, but it's something we might gradually look into, yeah, especially since we're looking to experiment with flowers soon and strawberries. That's another interesting one to play around with. You need bees, perhaps, inside. <laughs> that would be so interesting. I'm not sure. There is a there is a company out there that says they use, they, they have bees in their farms. So we're not too sure how that will work, but yeah. Wouldn't that be amazing? What if you could find a way of growing manuka and having bees as well? That would just be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Kill many birds yeah. with one stone, yeah. <laughs> So um, next one from the audience. What about power outages? I can't imagine what would happen to the crops if something happened to the electricity supply. Do you have backup generators or something like that? Yes, definitely. But uh, even without power, plants will survive for a few days. So we definitely have contingencies whenever we build new farms. We definitely build in contingencies and we build in contingencies to contingencies mm -hmm. to ensure that these kind of issues are mitigated to the best of our, our abilities. So what are the contingencies, Sean, if it's not generators, what are the contingencies? Um, batteries. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah but, I mean, generators are enormously expensive, aren't they? Mm. Uh, you can lease them. Yeah, I just know our office in Myanmar has a generator that's very expensive to use. I would assume so. Yeah. So yeah. another question. Is this easier than gardening? Because I never get that right. It would be great to grow something without it withering away. Well, I suppose it's different from gardening, right? It depends what you're good at. I would say it's actually, it's most likely easier than gardening, especially if you have like a home kit that we're looking to develop. So it's, it's really the point of, indoor farming i guess it's it's really about the push of a button no like uh, you just put it there you leave something in there and then something comes out out of it in a few weeks that's kind of the goal when it comes to the way we farm we want to make the whole process so autonomous and so simple that you just have to put a seed in a you might not even have to put a seed in there someone some robot could be putting the seed in there for you and you just have to eat the vegetables so yeah it could be easier than gardening down the road it already is actually so. You're inspiring me, Sean. I've always been quite intimidated by gardening. <laughs> <laughs> it is a, it is pretty volatile, isn't it? Already. <laughs> so tell me, what would be the ultimate goal with this great thing that you're doing, Sean? Both for yourself in terms of sort of life achievement, and also for the company. What would be the ultimate goal you'd wish to achieve, both personally and for the company? Um, personally, I I would just have a philosophy of uh, democratization in general. No, I'm very keen on giving power to the people in the sense that giving people the ability to grow their own food, the ability to, uh, well, all kinds of democratization. So that's what my aspiration is with the company. I would like to have the company create a way to help people grow food wherever they are, whenever, you know, whenever they need it and just give them that opportunity to do so at a, sensible cost, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's amazing because that will change everybody's own mindset and the way of looking at themselves and at the world, really, won't it? If they can really do that. Yeah, totally agree. And what about for the company? Yeah, that, so I hope the company does the same. I mean, the company's trajectory is towards helping people get food whenever they need food. And uh, food self-sustenance, food security, um, that's, that's the overall goal. And hopefully that's why the dream is for the company's uh, products, whatever they may be, whether it's the systems, software, the crops, to be in every single household in the world if possible. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Sean. Doesn't an hour go quickly? That was really great. I do hope we can have another chat maybe in a year's time or something like that or a few months' time to see where you're getting to because it's just such an amazing subject. and. Everyone is involved in this. I think it changes their lives. It touches everybody's life amazingly for anyone who's involved in this. Um, so that brings us to the conclusion of this webinar. And thanks so much again, Sean, for being with me today. And thanks everybody who's joined us. 
And if you're based in Malaysia, please do visit the website and um, look at um, the products you can order. And wherever you are, have a look at the website and look at all the exciting things which this company is doing. We look forward to seeing you again at another Commonwealth Chamber event. And thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you again, Sean. Bye, everybody. Thank you.